all our workers and thank you for all the people that make the workers a treat what, at, what it has been until this time we're praying oh lord that the impartation of the ministry to every life through all your ministers will be effective effectual abiding and permanent in jesus name Lord, as we come to this a final message on the series we're looking at now for the churches, we pray, Lord, all that we still need to learn about your church built on the rock and built on the foundation of your word. We pray that you reveal everything that is seen necessary to everyone in Jesus' name. As you are helping us and making use of us to build the church, build us too in Jesus' name. Build the families in Jesus' name. Build the work of our hands in Jesus' name. As you have told us that nothing will prevail against your church, we pray for every individual here, brother and sister. We pray, Lord, nothing will be able to prevail against any of your children in Jesus' name. This house will stand. This church will stand everyone here every minister every overseer every pastor every worker here we will stand in jesus name no weapon that is fashioned against your life shall prosper and nothing that is fashioned against the ministry god has committed into your hand nothing that's against your ministry will prosper in jesus name you will continue to the end you will build a house that will stand and God will make this work to prosper in your hands in Jesus' name. Lord, let this house stand. Let this church stand. And help us, Lord, to carefully build on the foundation of the word of God. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're looking at um, Revelation chapter 3. And as we come to Revelation chapter 3, I want to remind you once again that we have been on this series of the messages of the Lord Jesus Christ to the churches of Asia Minor. But you understand, when Paul the Apostle was used of God to write an epistle to the Romans, it's not just for the Romans, it's for the whole church in the whole age. And when Paul the Apostle wrote 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, it was not only for 1 Corinthian people, it's for the church in the whole age. And each of the churches, Galatians, Ephesians, and then the Philippi, the, to the Philippians, and to Colossians, and to all the Thessalonians, all those epistles, is for the whole church. The same thing, the message of Christ to these churches in Asia Minor is to the whole church. That's why we have been taking those messages one by one. Number one, a fundamental church in a pluralistic world. Number two, a fearless church in a persecuting world. Number three, a faltering church in a perverted world. Number four, a feeble church in a putrefying world. Number five, a formal church in a perishing world. Number six, a faithful church in a pessimistic world. Now we come to the final church, a flattered church in a permissive world. A flattered church in a permissive world. We're living in a world that permits everything, anything. And there are people that allow the color of the church, the posture of the church, the stage of the church, the programs in the church, and the organization of the church to align themselves to the permissive world in which they live. It's like anything goes. And because anything goes in the world, they think anything also ought to go in the church. We're looking at Revelation chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 14. And unto the angel of the church in the, in, of the Laodiceans write. Once again, I want to remind you that Jesus Christ addressed all the churches and he referred to the leader there, the pastor there, the shepherd there, the overseer there as the angel. And it says, the angel. By the way, did you say to an angel in the church? 
as if to an angel that could be you that could be him to the particular angel because God gives the responsibility of leading that house fellowship, that local church, that district church, that regional church, that state church, that national church. He gives that responsibility to the man there. He calls overseer. He calls shepherd. He calls pastor teacher. And is the angel in that church. By the way, why are they referred to or why we refer to as angels? We're looking at Matthew chapter 25. In Matthew chapter 25, I'm reading from verse 31, and you'll see the nature of the angels, and then that compares with our nature. You will see the character of the angels that compares with our character. You will see the comportment of the angels, and that, co that compares with our comportment. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, when, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the what kind of angels holy angels with him holy angels with him holy angels with him and as the angels are holy so he expects the leader in the church call him bishop the leader in the church call him overseer the leader in the church call him apostle the leader in the church call him teacher the leader in the church call him pastor the leader in the church must be holy as well look at titus chapter one titus chapter one i'm going to read from verse seven from verse eight and from verse nine in titus chapter one verse seven for a bishop for the overseer for a pastor for a shepherd for a leader must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not giving to wine, no striker, not giving to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, what's the next word there? Holy, holy, temperate. Holding fast the faithful word, as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. As you look at the qualifications here for the bishop, for the pastor, for the overseer, you will find that just exactly what God expects of an angel. An angel ought to be blameless. An angel is the steward of God. An angel is not self-willed. An angel is not angry. An angel just goes to the person the Lord has sent him to and he delivers the message and he doesn't have any kind of personal thing to grind with the people that he has been sent to. And he's no striker. He does just exactly what the Lord has told him to do. It's not, it's not giving to feel the looker. That is, when the Lord sends those angels to those people, even to give them anything, what are you going to give them? They're not greedy of anything. And they're just, uh, you know, they're lover of good men, and they're sober just, and they're holy and temperate, and they hold fast the faithful word as the Lord has given them to deliver to the people he has sent them to. And so you receive the reason why it says to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans right. It's uh, telling us that we should be holy as the angels are holy. And it is that holiness of character, holiness of comportment, holiness and lifestyle, holiness through and through, holiness in the holiness in the day, holiness in the night, holiness in the private, holiness in the public that qualifies us to say the angel of the church is such and such a place. Now the church itself. What's the church to look like? We're looking at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. The house that is built on the foundation of the word of God. The church that is built on the foundation of Christ himself being the cornerstone. What's that church to look like? Holy bishops and holy overseers and holy pastors raising up holy churches. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and he gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present that church to himself, a glorious church, 
not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. You can see then why it says to the angel of the church, if the church is supposed to be holy, the church is supposed to be righteous, the church is supposed to be pure, how can the pastor there be any less than that? If you are not holy, how can you raise up a holy church? If you are not righteous, how can you raise up a righteous church? And if you are not pure, how can you raise up a pure church? If you find a pastor there, if you find a shepherd there, if you find a bishop there who is not holy, who is messing up his life with the members of the church, get him out of that place. There is no way a man like that, that is unholy, will make the church holy and righteous and rapturable. Because it says to the angel of the church, and then the world in which we're ministering, the world, the world, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, rather, 2 Timothy chapter 3, what kind of world is this? What kind of world? Look at it from verse 1. This know also that in the last days, very lost time shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. That's the world. Covetous, that's the world. Boasters, that's the world. Proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, that's the world. Unholy, that's the world. And here you have an unholy world an unrighteous world, an impermissive world that allows anything, anything unrighteous, anything ungodly, anything unholy. And here is a man God has raised up. Here is a woman God has raised up that he will now take people out of the unholy world and make them part of the holy church. Obviously, he, all, he must be holy. She must be holy. It says the world is even without natural affection. Truth breakers, fierce, uh, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. He's talking about the world. Now, let me, let, let me ask from you. If the person that is to take people out of the world and bring them to the church, the house Christ is building. The church Christ is building. And that church is supposed to be holy and pure, godly and righteous. If the man himself is not angelic, if the man himself is not saintly, if the man himself is not holy, if the man himself is a lover of his own self, is self-centered, is self-conceited, if the man or the woman who is a worker is covetous, if he or she is proud, if he or she is a blasphemer, if he or she is disobedient to her spiritual parents, his spiritual parents, if he or she is unthankful, ungrateful, ungodly, unholy, unrighteous, if he himself or she is without natural affection, truth breakers cannot keep to the promise that she has given to the Lord, he has given to the Lord. If he's a false accuser, incontinent, cannot control self, cannot discipline self, fears, despisers of those that are good. How will such a man, how will such a woman, how will such a minister, how will such a worker be able to raise up a church that is holy and pure and righteous and godly? If that pastor or preacher, if that Sunday job teacher, if that zonal leader, if that uh, children church worker, if that uh, youth leader is a traitor, is heady, is high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. If he's not through and through genuine, if he's not really standing internally on the word of God, if he's not living a life that is solid and scriptural and saved and sanctified, how will such an individual be able to raise up a church that is holy? 
that's the reason why uh, I believe that as we look at the word of God, you'll see sometimes why a pastor might be told to step aside. A pastor might be told, go and pray for some time. A pastor might be told, you are not in control of your life. You are not in control of your, of, of your grace, of the grace within you. You are not in control of the things you ought to do. And because you are unrighteous, ungodly, unholy, and because you are impure, step aside because we are raising a holy church. And that's why you yourself, you want to be faithful. If you find that you are unholy, if you find that you are unrighteous, if you find that you are impure and we didn't know, you'll be able to say, I think I need to step aside. I need some, I need to get my, I need to get my life put together again because things are not all right with me. And except we do that, what kind of church are we going to build? It says having a form of godliness in verse 5, but denying the part thereof from such, tell me, turn away from such, turn away. What it means is that you see somebody having a form of godliness, they know what to say superficially. They know the doctrine superficially. They know the Christian life superficially, but they deny the power thereof. The power thereof is not working in their lives. It says when you are making choice to be a region overseer, to be a state overseer, to be a national overseer from such, turn away. When you want people to come and help in building a church that will stand, a church that will stand in righteousness and holiness, and you find the person not only he can answer questions, he has it in the head, it's not in the heart. You see that his life is not holy, his life is not righteous, his life is not godly. From such, turn away. When you are making selection, you do this and you do this and you do that, and you find a man, you find a woman that this one cannot trace up a solid church, a standing church, cannot trace up his scriptural church, cannot trace up a sanctified, holy, pure church. You tell them to step aside from such, turn away. He tells us in verses, for this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women lady will says led away with diverse laws ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth he is this now as janice and jambres withstood moses so do these resist the truth when well, you find people that resist the truth of the word of god how can they plant churches and now can they raise up churches that will stand stand against the permissiveness of the world in which we live and stand against the pollutions and and the perverseness of the world in which we live if they are resisting the truth the truth is not having impact on them and the truth is not having any effect on them it goes on to say that they are always learning but they come short of the knowledge of the truth these also resist the truth men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the truth but they shall proceed no further i said they shall produce no further and when you find people that just they impose themselves on the ministry they don't have the qualification. They don't have the righteousness. They don't have the life. They do not have the conviction. They do not have the consecration. It says, they shall proceed no further. They will be stopped. I said, they are going to be stopped. If they are just like caterpillars, we're building, we're building, and then they're cheering down what we're building. We're building lives, we're building families, we're building the church, and we're raising up people that will stand against the tide of temptation, against the tide of loss, against the tide of evil, against the tide of immorality, against the tide of sinning. And then these people are opposing the truth and opposing, opposing the righteous standard of the word of God. They shall proceed no further. For their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long suffering, my charity, my patience, persecutions, afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer, tell me. 
persecution. But evil men and, and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou. You will continue. But continue thou. I said you will continue. In the strength of the Lord, we will continue. In the power of the Lord, we'll continue. And with our consecration, with everything laid on the altar, we're going to continue in Jesus' name. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. Think about that. Holy scriptures where holy people raising up a holy church and representing standing in for the holy son of God and they were preaching in the power of the holy spirit and they were reading to them and were studying the scriptures which is the holy scriptures and were directing them to pray to the holy father in heaven and then we tell them prepare to enter into a holy heaven and then we'll join the angels that are calling holy 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 unto the lord almighty everything is the about holiness. That's why the people that are involved with the work, they are holy. And they are like the angels of God. And they are holy unto the Lord. From the child you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, profitable for reproof, profitable for correction, profitable for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect. He will perfect everything concerning you. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It's surprising then as we come to the church in uh, Laodicea. Look at this in Revelation chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 14. As we come to this church and unto the angel of the church of the Laodicea's right, these things says the Amen and the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy words, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. I know thy words. I know you are neither cold nor hot. You're neutral. You're neither here nor there. You're neither up nor down. You are neither supportive nor opposing. You are neither running nor halting. We can't place you. you. When you are in Rome, you do as the Romans do. When you come to Israel, you do as the Israelites do. Where do you stand? You are neither totally in the church nor in the world. Where do you stand? And the Lord said, I know thy works, but the problem is I cannot place you. Because thou art neither cold nor hot. I would, I prefer that you are either far away on the left hand side or far away on the right hand side. I would thou art cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods. And have need of nothing. Have need of nothing. This evaluation is different from the evaluation of Christ. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. That thou mayest be rich. And why tremend? That thou mayest be closed. And that the, naked, the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with thy self. That thou mayest see as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, be hot, be fervent. Be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh, I pray God will make you an overcomer. I said God will make you an overcomer. To him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. 
he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. I pray every one of us will have ears to hear in Jesus' name. I divide the message to three parts. Number one, Christ's perception of the lukewarm. Christ's perception of the lukewarm. Number two, Christ's prescription to the lukewarm. Christ's prescription to the lukewarm. Number three, Christ's precept and promise to the lukewarm. Number one, Christ's perception to the lukewarm. We're coming back to Revelation chapter 3 from verse 14. The Lord Jesus Christ introduced himself. Look at verse 14 unto the angel of the church of the Lord. This is right. These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. What's that, what does that mean? He said, is the Amen. The word Amen is a word of affirmation. A word of affirmation. It is, so let it be. It's the one that affirms the promises of God. It's the one that affirms the lives of the true believers and of the true disciples and of the true servants of the Lord. And his affirmation is right. Whatever he affirms to be correct is correct. Whatever he affirms to be true is true. And then he says, he is the, he is the true faith. He is the faithful and the true witness. His witness is true. His witness is according to the word of the Father. He never goes against, he never opposes, he never contradicts the word of the Father. He is a faithful witness and he is a true witness. And also when he witnesses the life of any of his own children, he is a faithful witness and he is a true witness. And then he says, he is the beginning of the creation of God. There are some people that will then say that Jesus was created because he is the beginning. They don't understand the language of the scripture here. The beginning here in the Greek language is, is the first cause. is the originator. And he is the author of the creation of God. That means without him was nothing made that was made. He is the originator. He is the creator. He is the very origin and he is the very power that brought everything into being. And what knowledge he has, what power he has, what wisdom he has, what authority he has, because he knows all things and he can do all things. And now he diagnosed the church. As he diagnosed the church, he tells us what the church looks like. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, I know thy works. He knows. I know that was is by observation he knew everything going on in every church and he knows what goes on in every life as well. He says, I know that was that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. Here the Lord is telling us about some people that there are some people that you can never you can never really tell who they are. They never do good, they never do bad. They never contribute anything positive, they never contribute anything negative. They do not add any value, neither do they subtract anything. It's like they're occupying the land in such a way that there's no production, no productivity. They don't show anything at all to show, I am here. It's like saying, they are neither corrupt nor holy, neither cold nor hot. It's like saying, they are neither crooked nor honest. You cannot really depend upon them. If you're looking for holiness, you cannot depend upon them. Jesus cannot make use of them because they are not holy. And maybe they are not also made use of by the people because they are not corrupt either. They are just like that neutral. They are neither crooked nor honest. They are neither carnally minded nor heavenly minded. They are neither here nor there. And the Lord is saying, I don't want that state of neutrality. I don't want that state of just being there and you cannot contribute positively to the progress of the kingdom of God and the perception of the Lord Jesus Christ concerning these people in Laodicea. And as you look at that, you are questioning, you are asking yourself, am I like that? Number one says, they were lukewarm. Number two, it means they were lethargic. Number three, it means they were lax and loose. Lax and loose. 
nothing, nothing is bad, nothing is good. Just live your life. Be at liberty and do whatever you want to do. Number four, it means that they would lean spiritually. They, 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 they won't lean upon the Lord. Neither can you lean upon them. They were, the leanness of their soul even testifies against them. It means, number five, they were light-hearted. Light-hearted. The lightness. They're not heavy. They're not, they, they don't have any weight at all. They are weighed and found wanting. Uh, you know, they, they have this light weight. They cannot confront anything. And in the language of scripture, they were lingering people. Lingering people. They want to come out of Sodom, but they are not on the mountaintop either. They come to the border of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. It is like they are saved. It's like they have come out. It's like they have escaped the pollutions and the corruption in Sodom, but they are still lingering. And around the valley it means these people eventually are lawless because they cannot be controlled by thus says the lord they're not firm they're not zealous and they're not giving totally to the lord they are just there are you like that neither cold nor hot neither up nor down neither zealous no you are not halting either you, you still manage to come to the bible study you still manage to come to sunday service but what's the effect what do you contribute that's the question number one then look warm look warm we're told that um, in the situation in uh, laodicea uh, there are two cities around Colosse and hierapolis and because they didn't have water there the hot water will be coming from Hierapolis. And as the hot water is coming, by the time it gets to um, Laodicea, already it's lukewarm. It's no more really hot, neither is it cold. And then cold water is coming from Colossae and through the pipe. By the time it gets to them, it's no more cold, it's lukewarm. So whether it is coming from this place, Hierapolis, or coming from this other place, Colossae, the whole thing is lukewarm by the time it gets to them. And then when the people th try to drink that they spew it out because it doesn't minister to them it doesn't refresh them you can't do anything with them neither cold nor hot and the lord jesus christ said these believers and this church in La laodicea they were just like that and jesus said i will spew thee out of my mouth again you know, there are people that say they believe eternal security and they say, once you are there, you are there forever. You can be cold, you can be lukewarm, you can be, you know, nauseating, whatever it is you are. You are there, you are always there. But Jesus said, no, if they are lukewarm, I'm going to spew them out. Then some people, I told number two, they are lethargic. Look at Judges chapter 18. Judges chapter 18, the people who are lethargic, they're not worried about anything. They're not concerned about anything. They just live their lives. It's a kind of a lazy life, an idle life. They're not up and doing. They just say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. They can't show anything for it. They live at ease. Look at this in Judges chapter, chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 7. Then five men departed and came to Laish. And saw the people that were that were therein, how they dwelt careless after the manner of the Sidonians, quiet and secure, and there was no magistrate in the land that might put them to shame in anything, and they were far from the Sidonians and had no business with any man. You know, that loose life, that careless life, that easygoing life, that idle life, and they had nothing to do with anybody, nobody to correct them, nobody to challenge them, and nobody to say stand up, nobody to say sit down. They just lived a life like they were lethargic, and life had no meaning. And look at the next verse, it says, And they came unto their brethren, to Zorah and Eshtaol. And their brethren said unto them, What say ye? And they said, Arise, that we may go up against them. For we have seen the land, and behold, it is very good. And are ye still? Be not slothful to go. Or to and to enter to possess the land when ye go ye shall come unto a people secure and a large land 
For God has given each into your hands a place where there is no want of any sin that is in the earth. We're rich. We have substance. We have material things. We have need of nothing. But look at the lesser jeep there. Are you like that? Nothing moves you. Nothing drives you. Nothing drives you to your knees. I have everything. What am I fasting for? I have everything. What am I praying for? I have every. What am I reading the Bible for? I, everything is made up for me. What am I zealous about? You see, that kind of lethargic situation will bring you into captivity eventually. Then there are people that are lax, loose and lax, loose and lax. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 48. Jeremiah chapter 48. Uh, do you find that these people it's like, you know, the, the, the life is just there. No discipline, no control, no challenge. They cannot walk briskly. They can, and they're, just, they're just like that. Is the going people. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 48 and verse 11. It says, Moab has been at ease from, her, from his youth and he has settled on his leaves. And has not been emptied from vessel to vessel, neither has gone into captivity. Therefore, his taste remains in him, and his sense is not changed. Therefore, behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will send unto him wanderers, and that shall cause him to wander, and shall empty his vessels and break their bottles. It says the Moab is just there. Sometimes you find a pastor is a pastor is in one location there, five years, seven years, and ten years. There's nothing contributed to the church there anymore. No program, no crusades, no dawn project, discipling the whole nation, nothing at all. It's just there. Bible study day, he goes there and maybe goes uh, with this, uh, you know, computerized uh, Bible and he doesn't have the real printed page of the Bible when he can mark the Bible and when he can, you know, turn around, which he can use. He all just has uh, this one that, you know, he can almost do not do anything with. And once the verses are even projected on the screen, he puts all that in the pocket after. It's the same thing. It's on the screen over there and then it's on the screen of my telly phone and uh, the screen of my laptop or, or the screen of my iPad and that's all easy going and there is nothing that challenges them and then after the Bible study to pray that's a challenge there, there is no fire there is no fervency there is no zeal there is no passion it's just like these people of Moab easy going and the Lord is saying that there is calamity going to come upon such people I pray that you will escape before calamity comes in Jesus name Amos chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 1. Amos, that's after Joel, and Joel, that's after, after Osea. I hope you can find it in time. Amos chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 1. It talks about these people that lax and loose. It says, Woe to them that at ease in Zion. Woe to them that at ease in Zion. You see the Zionists and see the people of God rising up. We're going to take the land. And we're going to the north. We're going to the south. We're going to the west and we're going to the east somebody is evangelizing there somebody is singing there somebody is training children there somebody is on the campus walk over there and that person is leading the women over there somebody is leading us worship and you are just there folding your hand you have attended congress you have attended easter retreat december retreat workers retreat and everything you are just there folding your hand you have nothing to do everybody is up and doing we're doing something somebody is preaching somebody is praying somebody doing whatever but you are just just there, watch them that are at ease in Zion. The condition of the Laodicean believers, they will not do anything while everybody else is busy. I pray God will deliver us from that in Jesus' name. And the, they become lean. They become lean spiritually. Lean spiritually. You know, there are people that feed the physical body alone. And they take care of their physical body. They wash the physical body. They feed the physical body. They brush the physical body. Body, they close the physical body, but their soul, their soul, their soul, they neglect. And there's this leanness in their spirit. If you will take care of your soul and your spirit as much as you take care of your body, 
and you know all the building where you want to buy land that's for the body and you want to live in shelter that's the body you want to own a car that's for the body you want to have your clothing that's for the body you want to put good shoes on that's for the body you want to have a good air coat and air dew that's for the body everything you do for the body if you can replicate that reproduce that for your soul you will grow tremendously but everything even your prayer is for the body the healing for the body everything for the body why don't you wake up and say all that i'm doing for my body i need to do for my soul i need to do for my spirit otherwise the leanness eventually you become so light when you are lean and you'll not be able to do anything at all and let's look at this in the psalm 106 psalm 106 i'm reading from verse 14 and verse 15 and this is the condition of the people in Laodicea and they never knew they never knew Psalm 106 I'm reading from verse 14 it says in verse 14 but they lost it but lost it exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted tempted God in the desert it's talking about they lost it after food what shall we eat they lost it after water. What shall we drink? If you look at all the complaints, all the complaints of the children of Israel in the wilderness, everything boiled down to food and water, drink and, and meat. That's what it boiled down to. It was not, how far are we from the promised land? When are we going to, to get to the promised land? And how are we getting the law of God in our system? Are we living right? Are we going to do this and do this? How do we please God? If you look at the wilderness journey of the children of Israel, all their complaints centered on the material things, on the physical thing. The spiritual was not there. Look at verse 15. He gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. Souls. He sent leanness into their souls. Are, not, are they are not people because of what shall we eat and what shall we drink? And the desire for the things of this world, how lean we become. How emaciated we have become spiritually. We are not robust on the inside. We are not strong. Our spiritual bones are weak. They are easily broken. Our spiritual backbone is weak. It's easily broken. Our muscles are weak. We cannot carry any load at all. We are not exercising ourselves. All the exercises the people are trying to do, everything majors on the physical. But in our soulish realm, in our spiritual realm, in our hearts, everything is lean. And I pray that God will change all that in Jesus' name. Uh, can you see these people, light-hearted people? We have everything. We have every And the Lord Jesus said, don't you know your condition? You are blind, you are wretched, you are miserable, and you, don't, you are naked as well. It's, it's just like Esau. Look at the language of Esau in uh, Genesis chapter 33. Genesis chapter 33, I'm reading from verse 9. Genesis chapter 33, I'm reading from verse 9. It says, And Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep that thou hast unto thyself. Here is a Joseph coming from Laban. And he has all this, you know, wife and children and all these uh, sheep and all that. And I wanted to be a blessing to Esau. And Esau said, I have enough. I have lost the first day. I have lost the birthright, but I have enough. I have lost the blessing of Abraham and Isaac, but I have enough. I have lost my destiny, but I have enough. I have enough, my brother. Keep that which you have. Isn't it like the Laodicean people? We have enough. We have need of nothing. We have got everything. This is so that said, I have enough, my brother. Keep that which you have. Let's see his condition. Esau said, I have enough. We're looking at Hebrews. Hebrews Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, I have enough, I have enough. Do you really have enough, Esau? Do you remember that your birthright is gone? Are you not thinking of the future? Are you not thinking of the spiritual dimension of what you could get? I have enough. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 12 and we're reading from verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. Any fornicator and profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance. 
though he sought it carefully with tears. That's a man that said, I have enough. Laodicean member, and a, a member of the Laodicean church, I have enough. And he had nothing. He had nothing. Destiny gone. Birthright gone. Privilege gone. The privilege of the children of God taken away. Number, number six, the lingering fellow. The one that is lingering at the very border of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, lingering. Those are the people, and, you, and they're, even, they're even willing to discuss and argue with the angel of God. And look at this in Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19, I'm reading from verse, I'm reading from verse 15. And these uh, people, uh, they are so much related to the Laodicean people. It says in uh, chapter 19 of Genesis verse 15, and when the morning arose, then the angels hastened the Lord, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. They brought them out of the city. There are people that tell us of, uh, they say it's uh, election, predestination. They say that if God wants you to escape, you'll escape. Don't worry about it at all. They say, take your time and rest. Those who will be saved, God has marked them down. And if you're going to be saved, you will be saved. Whether you repent or not, whether you make an effort or not, whether you pray or not, whether you consecrate or not, whether you seek the Lord or not, those who will be saved will be saved. And once he has saved you, it's from all eternity you are saved. Before you are conceived in your mother's belly, they say you are saved. Before you are born to this earth, they say you are saved. Before you even open your eyes to see any page of the Bible, they say you are saved. They say before you even heard about Jesus Christ, they say you are saved. Don't worry about it. Take it easy. Salvation is forever. But look at this. These people came out of Sodom. And it's like, okay, if, if they were saved already, so since they were saved, and God knew they were going to be saved, whatever they did, now whether they lingered or not, whether they stayed here or stayed over there, they will be saved. But look at this. Can I read you verse 26? Verse 26. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. She came out of Sodom and Gomorrah, but she didn't get to where she was going. I pray you'll get to that Canaan land in Jesus' name. But look at verse 16. While he lingered, while he lingered, while he lingered. Can you see the pronoun there? It doesn't say why, while they lingered, but while he lingered. The point is, if the father is lingering, that will affect the children. If the father is lingering, that will affect the wife. While he lingered, they couldn't go beyond Lord. They couldn't go beyond him while he lingered. If that man had not lingered, his wife might not have perished. And see the story of the family of Lord. What came after that, you know, the two daughters said there's no man on earth to marry us and to produce children. And they made their father drunk and they had children through their father. That would not have happened. The Moabites would not have been born. And the Ammonites would not have been born. If it were not for that lingering, there is a cause, there's a price, a terrible price to pay. When you linger as a man in the family, when you linger as a pastor in the church, when you linger as a leader in that fellowship, there is a price to pay. Many other people can be lost because you are lingering, because you are in a Laodicean church. I have need of nothing. It says in verse 16, and while he lingered, the man laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord be merciful upon him. And then it says, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth that he said, escape, escape, escape for thy life, be up and doing, hurry up. Discretion is coming. Escape for your life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lord said, and Lord said, Oh, the daughters had no voice, they had no voice, they had nothing to say because their father was there. And Lord said, The wife had nothing to say, uh, that is, they were not acting independent and they were not even counseling their father, they were not counseling the husband. And Lord said, 
and what Lord said affected everybody else. And then that's why, you know, as a leader, if you are lingering, as a leader, if you are not up and doing, then you go back to that house fellowship, go back to that district, and go back to that women fellowship, and go back to the people. Here you are, we've been here for all these days now, and we have had all these messages, and it has not made any change. You have not turned around. You have not made up your mind, I'm fleeing to the mountaintop of righteous and mountaintop of holiness, and you're still lingering at this very hour, at this moment, and what you do and what you don't do will affect the people that are coming from behind you. And Lord said, oh no, oh not so, my Lord. You know the rest of the story. That's why Jesus said, take note of this in Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 32. Jesus said, remember Lord's wife. Remember Lord's wife. Remember Lord's wife. I pray you'll not linger in Jesus' name. About lawlessness, lawlessness, lawlessness. That, that's what you'll find. You know, the people that say, hey, don't take him. You know, the Lord so, so hard and so hard. He's a good God. He's a good God. He's the one that burnt off Sodom and Gomorrah. He's a good God. Don't, don't make God so hard. He's the one that drowned Pharaoh and the chariots in the Red Sea. He's a good God. Don't, don't worry about all this. Everything will be all right by and by. He's the one that destroyed all those Canaanites and all those Jericho walls fell flat. And then the children of Israel they went in and destroyed all those sinners. He's a good God. Hey, don't make it so serious. If we don't do it today, we'll do it tomorrow. If we miss it now, we'll, you know, we'll get it later. Is the one that turned Lord's wife into a pillar of salt. You better hurry up and stop lingering and stop being all this neither cold nor hot and just, just like that. You are neither here nor there. Something must change. It will change at this time in Jesus' name. You know, the people that will not be controlled by anything, that will not be controlled by any law of God. And the way they are today is the way they have always been. When, the ch when is the change going to take place? Your change will take place today in Jesus' name. Look at Osea, Osea chapter 8. Osea chapter 8 in verse 3. It says, Israel has cast off the thing that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. You know, the children of Israel, as uh, Moses was with them, he gave them the law. Eventually, they looked at the law. Moses is no more there now. And then they cast it all. The good thing, the what made them different from all the other nations. It says, Israel has cast off the thing that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. Look at verse 4. They have set up kings, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. You know, the people, they just uh, cast off all those principles and all those regulations, all the word of God. It says they made up kings, but not by me. They choose husbands, but not by me. And they choose their wives, but no more by me. No more praying, anybody praying for the will of God anymore. I met, you know, that sister somewhere. I think she'll be good enough for me. I met uh, that brother. I, that brother is also a worker, wonderful. And uh, are you married? No, I'm not married yet. I about my mind, good looking enough. I, I think so. I think you'll be a good wife. Their faces don't show who will be a good wife. It's the heart, it's the will of God, it's the mind of God. But it cast off the sin that. That is good and it says the enemy shall pursue them and now they choose husband they choose wife and it says that it's not by me even in appointing pastors and overseers now they look at that fellow and that they say that since when have you been in the church i've been in the church for about eight years now what are you doing in the church well i'm still leading house fellowship come on you can be a pastor come and pastor this other place is that how we choose pastors now and it is no more by the directives of the lord and it says i didn't even know Know about that. Look at verse 8. Israel is swallowed up. Now shall they be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein is no pleasure. As a vessel wherein is no pleasure. That kind of uh, attitude, a laissez-faire attitude, a kind of uh, you know, liberty kind of thing, it, it's going to land us to become vessels in which there is no pleasure. Look at verse 12. Verse 12, it says I have, I have reached 
mentioned to him the great things of my Lord, but they were counted as a strange thing. When people now count the doctrines of the Bible as a strange thing, it's like, you know, we can do whatever I want now because the law is strange. The doctrine is strange. Do's and don'ts, that is strange. It's all now free grace and do whatever you want to do. They've come to the life of the Laodicean church and the Lord Jesus is saying, when it is like that, with that lukewarmness, when it is like that, with that lethargy, when it is like that, with that laxity and looseness, when it is like that, with that leanness spiritually, when it is like that, the light-heartedness, when it is that, like that, the lingering posture, when it is like that, the lawlessness, I'll spew you out of my mouth, except you repent. We're coming to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, the Lord is telling us the perception he had concerning these people. He said in verse 15, I know thy works, chapter 3, verse 15, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I will, I would thou art cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spill thee out of my mouth. And then begins to tell them about their condition. Look at verse 17, because thou says, I am rich, I'm rich. And then it says, I'm increased with goods, and I've need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I pray the Lord will turn our spiritual condition around, even in the short time we still have before the end of the workers' retreat in Jesus' name. We'll come to point number two, Christ's prescription to the lukewarm. Christ's prescription to the lukewarm. I'm coming to verse 18. I counsel thee, I counsel thee to buy, to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. It says this is true riches. The other one you are holding on to material riches, material blessing. It says that is nothing. It says I'm counseling you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Your mind is not in the market. Your mind is not from, you know, a great store somewhere. Your mind is from the Lord himself. It's talking about something spiritual. You buy this with prayer. You buy this with repentance. You buy this with consecration. You come and say, Lord, I'm wretched. I'm miserable spiritually. I want something that reaches, spiritual riches for my soul, for my spirit. Give it to me. You buy it from the Lord. And it says, white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. This is not talking about the one you put on your body. You have something in your body already. It's talking about the garment of righteousness. It's talking about that garment that the rapturable people will wear eventually the righteousness of the Lord. It says that, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve. It's not talking of the eye drop you put on your eyes. It's talking of the whole Holy Ghost himself, he'll brighten your vision in Jesus' name that thou mayest see. You see the prescription that Christ, Jesus Christ, the great physician prescribes is the remedy for this sick anemic church. For their lukewarmness, Christ, the Lord Jesus, he preserves zeal and repentance. And for their spiritual poverty and wretchedness and misery, he counseled them to buy of him, not from the world, to buy of him gold tried in the fire, so that they can become rich in faith and rich towards God. And then he told them for their spiritual blindness, he prescribed for them eyes so that they obtain that from him, and then their spiritual eyes can be restored, and they will have clear vision to see eternal verities, eternal realities and eternal reward gold is emblematic of something pure pure religion undefiled before the lord that which makes us truly rich in the sight of god the white raiment refers to our salvation our sanctification our holiness look at this in revelation chapter 19 revelation chapter 19 is telling us that we need to receive this so that when that time will come we'll be with him and will not be ashamed in jesus name it says in revelation chapter 19 i'm reading from verse 6 and I had as it were the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunder, saying, Hallelujah! For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. I pray you'll be ready. 
and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. The righteousness of the saints. You'll have it in Jesus' name. And so the Lord is telling us, prepare for your future relationship with me. It's important that we get all this preparation so that by the grace of God, when that time shall come, we'll have done everything necessary and will not be found wanting at that time in Jesus' name. As we look at this prescription, look at Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23 I'm reading from verse 23 it says buy the truth and sell it not buy the truth and sell it not the truth of the word of God buy that and don't sell it don't sell it for anything you know there are people they get the truth and then just a little thing like Esau they exchange it they sell their birthright but here the Lord is saying buy the truth and sell it not you will not sell the truth I said you'll not sell the truth. There are some people that, you know, when, when challenges come, it's at the time of marriage, a time of wedding, they sell the truth. All the truth they are bought by repentance, by prayer, by consecration, and all the workers' retreat and everything they have attended at the time of marriage or wedding or it may be reception. They, they throw away the truth and sell the truth. I pray you'll not sell the truth in Jesus' name. There are some young men, they, they'll sell the truth to, you know, their so-called wife. You know, the wife has come to their lives now, and everything they know completely conviction anymore. No conviction anymore. And they cannot retain the truth even in the marriage. I pray it will not happen to you in Jesus' name. It sometimes is the wife that had the truth. And now you've gotten married, you just discovered this man does not have all the truth that I have. And then the, the, the wife was okay, I'm married to keep peace in my family. What kind of peace is that that makes you to lose conviction in heaven? Then they sell the truth. I will not sell the truth. I said I will not sell the truth. You know, sometimes people get to their place of work and because they get to that place of work and then they tell them, this is what you do here, this is what you don't do here, and then if we tell you to sign any check, do not ask the reason why, and don't ask where we lodge in that thing, just sign it. Even if it's going to be fraud, just sign it. And the truth they had bought, they bought the truth and then they sell the truth like that. You'll not sell the truth in Jesus' name. You're having a contract somewhere and then because of that contract, the truth you know no, to live a honest, a honest life, a holy life, righteous life. You sell the truth because of contract, because of houses, because of this or that. I will not sell the truth. I said I will not sell the truth. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Look at verse 26. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. The Lord is telling us in Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. He tells us from verse 1. You buy this with repentance. You buy this with consecration. You buy this with self-denial. You buy this by laying everything upon the altar. You buy this by faith. Oh, everyone that thirsted, come ye to the waters. He that has no money, come ye and buy. This not is not a money matter. This repentance this restitution and then you seek the favor of God you lay everything upon the altar consecration that's how you buy this spiritual riches it says they that have no money come ye buy and eat and ye come buy wine and milk without money you can tell it's not the milk you buy in the store it's not the, the wine you buy in the store because you have to buy that one with money but this one without money and without price wherefore do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which satisfies not hacking diligently unto me and eat and eat ye that that ye that, that that which is good and let your soul delight itself in fatness incline your ear come unto me here and your soul shall live and i will make an everlasting covenant with you even the sure mercies of david behold i have given him that's the lord jesus christ for a witness to the people and a leader and a commander of the people behold thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel for he has glorified thee. Give me a good amen there. 
Now seek ye the Lord. Seek ye the Lord. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he's near. This is how we buy what he's telling us to buy. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the righteous man is thoughts. And let him return, return, return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon, uh, upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. That mercy of the Lord will be for every one of us this morning in Jesus' name. It tells us then that this is what we are to do. And when we do it, the Lord will show his grace and mercy upon our lives. Point number three, Christ's precept and promise to the lukewarm. Precept and promise, precept and promise. We're now back in Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 19. Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasing. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasing. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasing. Stop there for a moment. There are some people, there are some churches out there. They're always looking at the people in our own church. Instead of going to do their evangelism, you know, to the sinners outside and bring those sinners to the knowledge of salvation. All they try to do, they're always asking questions from deeper life people. Anyone on discipline, anyone set aside to go and pray, anyone this and that. And then when they discover, they go to those people. They say, we hear that your church deeper life has disciplined you. We hear that your church deeper life has told you to step aside. Well, deeper life, they have doctrine, they don't have any law. But you know, in our own church, there's no discipline. In our own church, and, you know, everything goes therefore come to our church and well i'm already a pastor in deeper life that doesn't matter come to our church and the day you come you'll become a pastor is that how you do it over there i'm telling you that there's no you know over there in deeper life where they don't love you we're asking you to come so that we can show our love to you because they think that when you correct somebody you don't have love they think that when you challenge someone to say Hey, what are you doing there? That's not right. Shape up and repent so you can get to heaven. They think that when we tell them to pray, we don't have any love. And when we tell them to prepare for heaven, we don't have any love. When we tell them to get ready for the rapture, they think we don't have any love. But Jesus said, it is when you love a person, you'll correct him. It's when you love a person, you'll chastise him. Look at that verse again. I, as many as I love, I rebuke and chase him. And sometimes, what breaks down what breaks down discipline in a church like deep and life is that you discipline somebody. Something is wrong with his life. Something is wrong with her life. And then there are other churches trying to pull them away. Then you run very quickly to the overseer. Let's restore this man quickly. Let's restore this lady very quickly. Has she repented? No. Has she made everything right? No. Is she calling upon the Lord? No. Is she fervent now? No. Is she making everything? Has she done the restitution? No. Is is the life changing? Is he prepared for heaven now? No, but you know, Pastor, the, that other church is already visiting him and wants to get him away. And so that they will not get him away, let's, him, let's plant him back into the church very quickly. That's not Christianity. If he wants to get to heaven, if she wants to get to heaven, she will abide by the discipline of love. That's what Jesus said. Jesus was not afraid. Satan will grab them. Satan will take them and Satan will come and tell them, I'll give you this, I'll give you this. And then Jesus, for him to round up the discipline immediately. Look at what Jesus said. And the church must still stand by the word of God. Well, we'll stand in Jesus' name. And there are some of the parents that are telling us, I say they are telling us because some of them, they have the courage and the boldness to tell me. They say, you know, yes, you know, we love this church and we want our children to remain in this church. And if our, our children are saying that, you know, this holiness, that, you know, is tough, we don't know how to be holy. And this sanctification, we don't know how to be sanctified. This consecration, not to be consecrated. And this and this and that discipleship, the life of discipleship the parents are telling me and they are saying that because our children don't understand and we want our children to remain in deeper life change everything so that if you change the word of god our children will find it easy and then they'll not go and marry over there and marry over there and marry over there 
well, I'm sorry for your children. If they don't want to get for, to heaven, I'm sorry for your children. We don't have that authority to change the Bible because of your children or because of my children. It is the word of God. And it is not the word that will change. It's your children that will change. If you have not, if you have not helped your children to be born again, Children who are not born again cannot keep to the word of God. It takes grace. It, grace on spirit, it takes on spiritual stamina. And you yourself, if you are compromising with your children in your family, and you cannot bring your children under control to the word of God, to the lordship of Jesus Christ, and then you, you have the authority and you have the audacity to come back to us and tell us that we should change the word of God. You want me to endanger my own spiritual life to the Lord because he says, if I remove from the word, he will remove my name out of the book of life you want me to remove the word of god from that from the book so that i will lose my own eternal fellowship with the lord because of your children i want your children to remain but if your children have to leave i'm sorry let them leave this word will remain in jesus name i said this word will remain in jesus name as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And it says, be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and I will, I, will, I will sup with him and he with me. I pray that he will dine with us in Jesus' name. And then he tells us to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne he that has an ear to hear let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches him that overcometh him that overcometh who are those people you will overcome in jesus name number one if you are faithful number one if you are faithful number one if you are faithful you are faithful to the lord you are faithful to the word you are faithful to your calling you are faithful to everything the lord has laid down and has given unto you if you are faithful you'll overcome number two if you are fearless if you are fearless that's what jesus said fear not them that kill the body and after that they have nothing to do but i'm going to forewarn you that you'll fear god if you are fearless i'll say i don't care what they are going to do to me i don't care about persecution i don't care about anything fearless number three if you're fervent if you're fervent if you're fervent that what you hold you're holding firmly and you're fervent about it and there, there's no doubt about it everybody can say because out of the abundance of your heart all your actions will issue forth and that you're passionate you're zealous and you're fervent and then number four if you're free that is free. There's nothing tying your leg. You know, your wife is not tying a rope on your leg and saying, my husband, up to this point and no further. Your husband is not tying a rope on your leg, wife, my wife, up to this point and no further. That listen to the preaching of the word of God in deeper life, but when you carry your convictions, because you're in my home, take it to this point and no further. And then if the children are not tying rope on your leg and saying, daddy, mommy, we love you. We won't want to stay with you here and live in the home but you must check your christianity if it goes beyond this point then you are going to lose us i'm sorry if i have to lose those children I'll lose them then lose heaven because you know this is what the lord is saying you must be free to live for the lord and free to live in righteousness number five if you're fixed and focused if you're fixed and focused you you've set you've set up your mind you set your gaze and your face towards zion and say that's where i'm going and you will reach there in jesus name Number six, if you are following, following the Lord, every step, following the Lord, every step, it will take denial, self-denial, it will take cross-bearing, it will take whatever discipline, self-discipline, it will take sometimes even church discipline, but you are following and following. And then if you are finishing, that means unto the end, unto the end, unto the end, another step, another step, another step, until I finish. And say, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, but so that 
that I might finish the course that the Lord had given me to bear. And when that is your mind, that oh, nothing matters, pain does not matter, pleasure does not matter, pressure does not matter, persecution does not matter, poverty does not matter, people do not matter, nothing matters to you at all. All that matters is I will finish, I will finish, I will finish. You will finish in Jesus' name. If you're willing to be faithful, willing to be fearless, and willing to be fervent, if you're willing to be free, willing to be fixed and focused, if you're willing to follow the Lord, whatever it will take, and if you're willing to move on until you finish, the crown of life is waiting for you. And as Jesus overcame, you're going to overcome in Jesus' name. Will you be an overcomer? I said, will you be an overcomer? Are you ready to pay the price to be an overcomer? Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, I will be an overcomer. I will be an overcomer. I will be an overcomer. The grace of God is there. The power of the Lord is there. The sustaining power, the sustaining grace of the Lord is there. He will make you an overcomer. He will make you an overcomer. Make up your mind. He will make you an overcomer. Why don't you come to the Lord and say, oh Lord, here am I. I'm not going to allow anything to stop me or to hinder me or to limit me. I am going to be that overcomer. You're not going to compromise the gospel with your children. You're not going to compromise the gospel because of your wife. You're not going to compromise the gospel because of your friend. You're not going to compromise the gospel for your husband or for your wife. You want to stand until the very end. You're fixed and focused. Heaven is your goal and you're going to reach there. Pray and tell the Lord, I will.